right, welcome back. This is Riders of the Dawn. And today we're going to be talking about the economics of artistry, um, focusing on basically the, the transaction that takes place at the, uh, the end of the line for an artist to sell uh, some piece of art to somebody and, um, and make money, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is something that we've, we've been thinking about today is, as an artist, as authors, as musicians, we work really hard on a product. And at the end of that journey, it's easy to feel like you're entitled to some monetary gain from that hard work. Uh, but that's not always how it works because just because you, you did something and you created something, it, it doesn't mean that that is something that other people want. Yeah. So how do we, how do we make this economic trans transmission of value from producer to consumer and make it so that both people feel like they've received something beneficial. They've that everyone has gotten the best end of the bargain. The consumer feels like they've gotten the better end and the producer has feels like they've gotten the better end of the deal. Yeah, this is a basic this is like basic capitalism is mm -hmm. that um, no transaction or I should say, you know, free market capitalism, true capitalism. Um, true. The, yeah, true, true <laughs> capitalism. True. No no two parties make an exchange unless both parties feel like they benefit on some level. Um, you know, and if you, you price, price gouging is a great example. You're going to hear anytime there's a disaster, you're going to hear about some convenience store charging 20 bucks for a pair of double A batteries. Um, but what they don't think about with the price mechanism is that that high price is signaling to people that the batteries are rare, which they are because in an emergency, they can't get more batteries and there's a high demand for them. People need the batteries. Mm. So when you have a $20 set of batteries, it's look, oh, you're gouging the crap out of people when they need the batteries, but the $20 in ensures that the batteries are sitting on the shelf for the person who needs, who really needs them. Yeah. So somebody who comes down to the convenience store when there's a hurricane sees the $20 batteries and says, you know what? I'd, maybe I don't need those extra batteries. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need to, I don't need to pay 20. I have some batteries at home. I was kind of thinking I might get some extra ones. I'm going to leave them there. Yeah. The next guy comes in and he's like, I don't have enough batteries for my insulin pump. Mm -hmm. I will pay any amount of money to get the batteries for my insulin pump yeah. or whatever, whatever the, the whatever yeah. you know the particular good or service is like i have no food i'm willing to pay a large amount of money for food if you say that you can't raise prices in in a hurricane someone comes down and they're like well you know what i better go ahead and buy all the pop tarts just in case yeah. and then when someone comes down they're like i have no food do you have any food they're like well we sold it all within 30 minutes of the hurricane coming yeah because, because we're there not was allowed no, to raise our prices there was no scarcity mechanism in yeah there's order no to, uh... no price signal so how does that price signal work with with art, that's often a question that we're trying to figure out as artists. Yeah. And um, I think that's where people tend to like wag their finger of blame whenever they're not um, financially successful in, in an artistic endeavor. They're like, uh, there's something wrong with people that they didn't buy what I am. There's something wrong with the system or capitalism's bad because it didn't give me money for the thing that I did. And and not only <laughs> that, it's also, it's also the big signaler to to people to cry out to the government and say, hey, you know, the arts are failing. We need money in, in the arts. We need the government to come in and get involved in the arts because I deserve free money. Um, yeah. You and, know, and I put in a lot of labor, so therefore <laughs> I'm entitled to to or, or, the, or it's, it's financial not, gain. Yeah, the, in, it's not just labor. There's all these other intrinsic ideas. It's like, shouldn't the public have access to high oh, art, oh, you know, something oh, like that. When it's like, oh. when your orchestra's not making any money or can't sustain itself, the blame is on the, 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 the blame, like, where's the blame? Well, the public is not buying your orchestra tickets. Either mm -hmm. they're priced too high or you're not, there's some combination where their price to what you're, the product you're delivering is not equaling out for enough people. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'll just, I mean, give you an example of like a, a major orchestra um, and compare it to Metallica. There so you. let's imagine we're going to have the LA Philharmonic play. Now they're going to have one concert. They're going to put on one concert and it's going to be of, um, I don't know, name some. Maybe they're going to have uh, Anton Webern. There you go. <laughs> um, Arnold Schoenberg. Oh, God. Igor Stravinsky. Uh, and and um, um, Rodrigo. And Rodrigo, yeah, right? Julia so, Rodrigo. So let's say they have, this, they have this concert scheduled and it's like they – Maybe they pack Disney Hall, mm -hmm. but they look at it and they're like, we're still losing money. Mm -hmm. Well, um, they look at Metallica and they're like, Metallica played five nights in a row. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should play five nights in a row. Well, they won't do that because the orchestra musicians will be like, well, I need five times as much money. <laughs> 
It's like, but but ninety percent of the work happens before you get to the mm -hmm. more than ninety percent. Ninety nine percent of the work, ninety nine point nine nine percent of the work happens before you walk on stage. It happens when you learn your instrument. It happens when you're practicing your repertoire. It happens when you show up to rehearsal to learn everybody else's part. Mm -hmm. Then you finally walk on stage and you execute the music that you uh, that you've practiced. <laughs> And so what you, what you see is you see Metallica going on five nights a week and, and doing they, that mm -hmm. because, because in essence, that, that has become their practice time. So when they go out on stage, it's like they don't have to do extra rehearsal time. Yeah, they've right. rehearsed prior to the tour. Then they go out and tour and every night they're doing similar stuff. The same. Yeah. Sometimes they change the, the set list up each night to keep it kind of fresh. And that's kind of cool because it's a little different each time. Uh, but they'll play five nights in a row in LA because there's five nights worth of people who, who want, want to come to, see, want to come see him. Metallica. They're they'll not, play in Mexico City for five, six nights. They'll play a whole week sometimes. There's and, not five nights worth of people who want to see the LA Phil. Yeah. Yeah. And so like the, mm -hmm. the second night that they have the Stravinsky, which maybe they sold out because they got people coming in from all over. Like mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's only, there's, it's, those two nights are like half full and it's like, well, how do we get more people? Well, you got to change the programming or lower your prices. Yeah. And, you know, what they could do, you know, just as an example, is you play like f five nights and in a smaller venue that's cheaper mm -hmm. or you pay your musicians less. Like there's all these sorts of economic things that never end up happening yeah. um, with these orchestras. And I know we're kind of getting... Or you could pick music that people like, you know. <laughs> and I, and It's always and I a joke. This... you got to have Brahms, Beethoven, and Bach. Yeah, and I, I mean, concert. I say this, we, we just rattled off a bunch of composers that I like for the most part. But, yeah, I like Stravinsky. Um, I like Bayburn. But... I don't, this is, this is the issue. And I, as a younger man, I had a, I had a real problem with how bad pop music was. Like, I hate pop music. It's really bad. It's so vapid. Anybody could do it. Well, there's a, there's a huge population of people who do like it. And the market, the market is set up to serve the, those group of people. The other thing is the market is also set up to serve me who has very specific tastes. So yeah. when Dragon Force showed up in California a couple weeks back, I we got him. to go see Dragon Force. And yeah. it was awesome because it was in like a 500 person club and it was really intimate and it was the perfect place to see that band that I love. Um, the market is set up f to serve everybody in that way. Yeah, and and when you add the internet and recorded music into it, the value the value offered is even even crazier. Because um, I can listen to, if I want to spend today listening to only like obscure Norwegian black metal, I can do that with the internet. Yeah. No, I haven't seen them like live, but I still get to know what the music is, yeah. even though I'm, I'm completely isolated from that scene. Uh, and that's really, really cool um, because, you know, 200 years ago, you only got to hear the music that people around you were playing. That's it. Um, so there's this idea that like, oh, we've gotten we've gotten stupider with pop music because pop music is stupid. People in the past who listened to Mozart, they must have been so much smarter, except like most people who lived in Europe when Mozart was alive didn't listen to Mozart. They couldn't afford to go see him. <laughs> they didn't they listen to friends anybody. Of, they weren't friends of the Austrian emperor. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they did. So the only they listened to nothing or they sang songs to each other or they went mm -hmm. to the went to the pub and they heard someone like doing some. Uh, some Roschiato on a guitar and singing mm -hmm. some some folk song. That's yeah. what people. That's what music was for people. And so, to me, pop music is, of course, it's it's silly and vapid, but so is all music been always. Yeah. All music always. That's you know that's right. It's it's just when the only stuff that got written down, uh, you know, as as music was like you know the quote high art, which is the stuff for the yeah. aristocrats and the bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the stuff that we look back in history and say, oh, this is what people listen to. This yeah, it's is, great. It's, like, it's, so, it's oh, what a small class of Europeans listened to 150 yeah. years ago, 200 years ago. That's great. I have no problem with that. And I think it's awesome. And I do want to study it because it's, it's great independent of, of the fact that like most people during that time didn't actually listen to the music. Only during the Romantic period did you have more people starting to listen to to like the art music of the day. Um but anyway, let's 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 try to get back on track with um, swinging it back around to books. I think yeah, back to books. So we we had this diatribe with music because when people talk about supporting the arts, um, you never hear them about like supporting books. Yeah, right. Or, like there's no government funding. Though there is government funding of books, but not mm -hmm. the way that you think. It's like there's government funding of like dissertations and and right. and other kinds um, of academic work. 
and that's that's its, its own. It's not not thing, like books know? that people are not that to any, read. not oh, not that not anything that anyone wants to read, right? So when we're when we're talking, if you're an indie indie author and you're trying to figure out how to get people to buy your book, um, what where do you start? Where do you start? Because maybe you maybe you spent maybe you're like me and it took you five years to write your first book. Um, are you entitled to five years worth of money for that book? <laughs> no, no. No, you're entitled to what the value of the market is willing to deliver to you. And yeah. that's a really, really important point. Um, there's a lot of people who sort of get into writing and a lot of people get into music too. Um, and then they're shocked when no one wants to, to exchange money for their work. Yeah. And they're like, I don't understand. I worked so hard on this. I put a thousand hours worth of work into this. Of course, I'm going to sell it for $20. Yeah. And that's a completely ridiculous way to think of how you serve a market because that's completely focused on yourself. Yeah. And in capitalism, you can't focus on yourself. Yeah. Capitalism is focusing on the needs and wants of other people. And that's an important thing that people just kind of like glaze over when they, you know, they're like, Greedy people. Yeah, yeah. capitalism is all, people, about, is all about greed. Corporations. How, how can you greed, possibly greed, greed, give me money? Right? Anything. I but, don't understand. But, we, but if you can only have an exchange where two people benefit, in order to get that other person to give you money, you have to give them something they want or mm -hmm. they won't give you the money. Yeah. That's, that's the end of it. And so if you're looking at a, at, at a, a, near, a near faceless market like, like the Amazon marketplace, and now Amazon does a great job of, of giving authors the room and the platform they need to, to have a face. But if you're just starting out, you don't really have – people might see your picture. They might see your bio, and they, that doesn't mean anything to them because you've not offered them any value. You may have put a book on Amazon, but that doesn't mean that that book has value. And the thing that's missing from the creator to the consumer is trust because you don't have – there's there's no yeah, reason you, for you to – haven't. Yeah, you haven't convinced them ahead of time that the value transaction will yield them something positive. Yeah, that will benefit both of you. And this is this is just – it's one of those things that every entrepreneur should know, uh, that you need to be you need to be providing value up front before you can expect value in return. And so that's why I give away one of my books. One of my books is free. My – my book right now is 99 cents, um, even though you know, other because, people in the genre. That's a, that's a low that, risk threshold. People mm -hmm. are willing to spend a dollar um, and possibly get something that they don't want. Uh, much more so because if they if they spend $10, essentially they're going to be really committed to trying to read it. And if they don't feel like they got $10 worth of value out of it, they're, they're going to be, be mad. They're going to be mad. And that's you don't want to have customers mad at you. Um, because you get bad reviews. Bad reviews lead to less people, less consumer trust, which is the opposite of what you want. You want to get good reviews. You want to get good, honest reviews. You don't want to get good, not honest reviews. Yeah, right? there's no... Uh, <laughs> don't don't hire robots to write yeah. reviews for you. Oh. Trust me, it doesn't work out. Yeah. I, not that I've done it, but just, I know it doesn't work out for other I mean, authors. yeah, and plus you can just get banned off of Amazon, which will ruin any chance you have at a career. So. Yeah, and it's the same thing with trying to pay, um, like pay somebody to rank your book up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know of an author that tried to get a pretty cheap promotion package, and he got he got banned from Amazon. Like he got all of his stuff pulled off of Amazon, not just from, from, from like the, um, Kindle unlimited, right? The Kindle unlimited is, the, is where somebody pays a subscription service. And if they read your book, you basically you get paid by the page. Yeah. Um, kind of, you know, you can think of it as like YouTube for books or something. Um, and that's great, except what happened with this particular author. And I'm, I, I may reach out to him to see if I can get an interview with him is that he, he picked kind of a shady company and um, essentially what they did is they had a bunch of, of bots or click bots go in and click and Just read through, his, through book. his books. Yeah. And so what happened is his Kindle normalized pages like shot through the roof and that's going to rake your book up. It's going to rake your book way up to like number one based on everybody's reading it in Kindle Unlimited. But that's really easy to spot. So mm -hmm. any change by a certain amount of percentage automatically 
ticks over like uh, like, like hey. somebody has to go look at that and be like, hmm. <laughs> Yesterday you had a hundred Kindle normalized pages, right? Today you had a hundred thousand. Yeah. Pretty sure you're botting. Mm-hmm. We're kicking you we're off, kicking and and then not only do they kick you out of that service, they kick you off of Amazon because you're trying to manipulate the algorithm. And the algorithm is very important from Amazon's perspective because that is how they serve their customers is through that mm-hmm. through all of their many many algorithms. That's like when you buy a Hammerfall album, it's like you might like uh, Ed Guy, yeah. you know, you might like Glory Hammer, you yeah. know, you, you might, might like, like Stradivarius, s- you know. S- uh, I can't, I'm not Soundgarden. Um. You might like Sonata Soundgarden. Arctica. Yeah, you, you might, might like, like these other power metal yeah. bands, right? And then as you like, you click through it and you're like, oh, I'll, I'll buy the, the Glory Hammer album. It's like, you might like Twilight Force. You might like Lost Horizon. Yeah. And it guides you down this long tail until until you're at the end of it listening to nothing but like screaming high vocals. Yeah, and, shredding, and you're, you're only listening to the, the things time. that you like perfectly wanted to listen yeah, to your whole so, life that you didn't know existed. Yeah, but that's what Amazon wants to do is they mm-hmm. want to give you the things that you really want because that's how they make money and that's how they keep you coming back to the site. Yeah. So... If you mess that algorithm, they're going to be very upset about that, and they're not going to want to give you access to that um, to that advantage. Um, so, so the point there is that there's no like necessary. There's not necessarily any shortcut to yeah. getting to like getting exposure and getting people to trust you. If you offer upfront value, like um, we use the chocolate shop example. Yeah. So you go into a chocolate. Let's say you go into a candy store and they give you a piece of chocolate first thing, right? Now. If you're really selfish, you're going to think, and you're really focused on yourself, you're going to think, oh, man, what's the expense of this chocolate I'm supposed to give yeah. away? But the person gets the chocolate, they eat the chocolate, they're like, that chocolate was really good. Now they have a, an, a larger, you've upped their, first of all, you have their gratitude for giving you something for mm-hmm. free. And gratitude's valuable because we have a natural impulse to want to trade. So if somebody feels like they got some value for free, they're going to be more willing to buy something. And this is like a proven mm-hmm. marketing technique. You'd be more willing to buy something later on. But you've also instilled confidence in them because it's like, this chocolate was really good. If I buy more chocolate, I expect a similarly good experience. Yeah. If not better, because I'm getting more of it. Mm-hmm. Or I am I got the milk chocolate square, and now I'm going to no. try the caramel chocolate square. And I bet it's even better because it's got more to it. And now you've created some consumer confidence by offering some value up front. Yeah, and so this is this is why you see a lot of... of- book marketing people talk about giving your book away for free and this happens a lot um this this is kind of the the big marketing strategy right now with uh with ebooks is that you have what's called a magnet book where you you give a book away for free and at the end of that book you invite people to join your mailing list where you give them another book for free and that's how so you've given them something up front and that helps the the consumer say okay here's some free value did I enjoy this free value? Yeah, I did enjoy this free value. Oh, if I if I give him my email address, I get more value. I get more value for free. And now now you've so you've essentially given not just two pieces of chocolate, but two like ice cream sundaes. And then you say, if you liked those two, maybe you would consider buying this. Um, and so that signals that signals your trust, which is really important. You can't nobody's going to buy something from you if. if they don't trust you and it also has led to the point where now finally that value is beginning to return back to the author um and if you're looking at this and saying you mean i gotta put i gotta have three books and two of them i'm gonna give away for free before i actually get anything back i don't think this is right for me good i'm glad i can be the person who tells you that this isn't for you then the don't yeah, do something it, else if, if you have too much of a psychic psychic difficulty giving giving somebody some value mm-hmm. for free um, to develop, and what are you investing in when you give somebody something for free? First You're, of all, it costs. If you have a book, if you have an electronic book, the cost to give someone something for free after you've already completed it is essentially zero. Is, like, yeah. there's no real ongoing cost. Um, unless you're using like certain services, um, and you know, like I use book funnel to do some different things and, and you pay for that. And it's like, oh, you're paying to give people away your book. Well, and I'm paying to help develop a relationship because that's the investment Yeah, It's like, I've developed somebody's trust. That means I have a relationship with that person. And I really want people to feel like they can talk to me mm-hmm. and know who I am and have a response from me, which in turn lets them know further what they can expect from my writing whether it's going to be for them and whether they're going to have value down the road. And if they have confidence that they're going to have value down the road, then um, the next thing that I offer, they know that the value is there. They're going to buy it from me. 
um, and the, that we both benefit. That's the yeah. that's the whole thing. And nobody feels like they're tricked. It's it's everybody feels happy at the end of that exchange, which is what which is what happens in capitalism. If you're feeling like if you're feeling like you're getting screwed out of something, that's the government is likely involved. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I saw my, you know, saw a friend. It's like she lives down in Bakersfield, and it's like, man, the water here. They're they're coming out and saying there's all these bad chemicals in the water. And of course, I lived in Bakersfield uh, for a long time as a child and stuff. And it's like, yeah, how about that? How about that government monopoly on water? Right? <laughs> yeah. That's working out real great. It's like, well, these people should go to jail for not fixing this. It's like, are they? No. Okay. Yeah, funny how, yeah, how that works. Funny how that works. You know, but if if Aquafina were to sell a bunch of bottles of water that poison people. You some better believe be there, there'd be some, at least some money flying around yeah. there, right? Because you have a private corporation, and when somebody buys a bottle of Aquafina, there's a certain amount of trust that they've prepared a purified bottle of water for them mm -hmm. to drink. Um, that they're, they're getting something that won't kill them for their money. Yeah. Uh, it's like you're, it's like you're, you're creating a, a, an unspoken terms of service. Here's the terms of my service. I'm going to give you something. If you like it, you can buy something from me later. Yeah, um, and you want more. That's what it is. Is like you want more. Well, no, you, you can to, buy more. Yeah. You can buy more, and you're you're you know exactly what the value is going to be. It's like and like let's say and this is a real this is a thing that a lot of of people do in in indie publishing right now is you give you have a series mm -hmm. and you give the first book away for free. So the first book zero dollars or ninety nine cents. It's really cheap. Yeah. And people take a chance. They read it. They if they really enjoy it. You're like, well, number two is over here for two ninety nine. And the person having already read one book has a really good idea of what another book is going to be in terms of value. Like, is it worth three bucks to me? Yeah. Yeah. I'll continue that. And if it's not worth three bucks to them, they won't buy it. But then again, they wouldn't have bought the first book either. Yeah. So the the worst thing that can happen is somebody realizes that they don't want to read read more of your books. Yeah. Um. Well, they you wouldn't have made the first sale anyway to that person. So you're not you're not really like losing out on sales by by offering free value to people. What you're doing is you're taking a risk that you're going to find someone who actually does like your book, and that's the whole point. You have to put yourself out there to take those risks to see if people are going to like reading your book. And nobody's going to see if they if they might possibly perhaps like to read your book at four ninety nine. And by nobody, I mean very few people. So, there's people who do it, and but the you know there's a risk there too. Yeah. And, you know, if you're a, if you write your first book and you come out with it and you're like, I'm going to put it at $4.99, man, I worked so hard on this. It's such a good book. And somebody, somebody sees it and maybe like you've really nailed the sales copy for mm. like that person. They buy it for $4.99 and they don't like it. For five bucks, you're gonna get a one. You're gonna star get like review. a one star review and a thorough one star review because mm -hmm. there's different kinds of one star reviews. You know, go look up. Yeah. I want you to go if if you want to have a good time and you haven't read this book, go look up the reviews. Go on Amazon and look up Infinite Jest um, by David Foster Wallace. Now, I I actually don't recommend you read this book. <laughs> I, I, I can't I, – there's somebody out there that I think this book is for them. <laughs> but go read the reviews because you're going to get these five-star reviews where you're going to look at it and you're like, okay. And then you're going to get these one, two-star reviews that are so thorough. They're, 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 these are like – some of these are like doctoral dissertations on how bad this book is, right? <laughs> and the reason is and, – and this is why. It's like this is a great example. It's like you mm. you buy the book and, you know, you buy the ebook for $10.99. Right, it's a full on 1099 ebook, which is or 999 ebook, which is what Amazon sells. Where you buy the hardback for like 25 bucks, yeah. buy the paperback for like 16 bucks, and it's over a thousand pages. And if you buy it and you read all the way through to those to the end of that thousand pages, and that book didn't knock your socks off, you're gonna be pissed. Gonna be pissed. And not only does Infinite Jest have a very low chance of knocking anyone's socks off. Um, it has a really good chance of you getting to the end and getting David Foster Wallace's joke, what the infinite jest is, that it's a bad book you've read <laughs> or a bad book that you've read, right? To me, that's the, the infinite jest is that the story doesn't end. It's just like the book, you, you go to the last page, you're like, <laughs> what, what did I just read? I, what did I just spend 10 hours <laughs> reading? <laughs> I lost 10 hours, you know, and there's, it, there's some, there's comedy in it. Like if you're reading the book, it's not like, it's not like the worst read ever, but it's pretty, it's not, it's not fun for most people, but they, there's like this cult built around David Foster Wallace, who's written, I think, I think he wrote 
two books, three, three and one was published posthumously. But, um, you know, you get to the end of the book and if you get pissed by that ending, that one star review is coming down. And because oh, yeah. of the money and the time and the badness of it, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a master's thesis on everything wrong with the book. So think about it from that perspective too, is yeah. that if you, if you write a really bad book and it's 99 cents, you might get a three star review. They're like, I thought the book was okay, except for these things that were really bad. Yeah. And you'll be like, okay, three stars. I can maybe I can work to improve those things, yeah. and and you can uh, revise the book. You can you can take the doing. constructive criticism. You can take a constructive criticism, but if you put up if you put up a four ninety nine book and somebody buys it, and they give you a one star review and they tell you everything that's wrong with your humanity, <laughs> it's going to be a really bad feeling. Yeah, <laughs> no one likes getting one star reviews. I'm I have a certain amount of armor armor from it from doing all this YouTube stuff and from. Star Wars, basically. If you, <laughs> dude, if you want to like, if you want to catch the the biggest shit in the world, just say that, that, Star, uh, Wars that sucks. Star Wars sucks. And I've got death threats. I've had I've been called every name in the book. And eventually, you just kind of like your your brain stops reacting to it socially. To where, mm -hmm. I, if somebody were to in person start criticizing me, I I'd, I'd probably just start ripping them apart and not feel bad at all. Like I wouldn't like the insults wouldn't work because I've had them happen so much to me for so long that they don't affect me. And then it's finding that only the constructive criticisms that you notice among those comments that are like, oh, you're telling me what you didn't like about it and the effect and stuff. Maybe I need to think about how I can do that better and offer better value in the future. Because with the video, we're trying to offer value, right? Yeah. We're trying to, you're exchanging your time and your attention probably to an ad before this video. Um, in exchange for the content, right? Um, so we're trying to offer value. And if we're not offering enough value, then it's like, then let's upgrade that. Yeah. Let's, let's work on it. Let us know. And then not only that, it's it, it's not as though you can't walk away at any point. So that's, that's what's great about offering value up front is that nobody is invested enough to... Not walk be, away. Yeah, to not walk away. Um, it's not like, it's not like, you have to buy the book and suddenly you're married to the person and then you're like, wait, no, I didn't, I didn't want to do this. And, and then you're screwed, right? It's here's some, yeah, here's some free value. Yeah. And uh, if somebody, if somebody legitimately doesn't like your book, chances are they're not going to read it. Yeah. They're going to read part of the book and be like, I don't think I like this. And they'll just stop. And because they didn't finish the book, they probably won't leave a review, mm -hmm. which means you're going to be missing a lot of your bad reviews anyway. Yeah. But if somebody, somebody plops down some money some change for it there's like a commitment that they, they have to try to seek the value and that's when you might end up in, in a bit of trouble yeah it, it's kind of like if you if you go to a restaurant if you go to mcdonald's and your burger's not that great you probably aren't going to even say anything yeah you're probably just back like, eh, it wasn't good this time if you go to like smith and walensky and your steak doesn't come out absolutely, absolutely perfect yep. You're looking at the bill and you're like, I paid seventy dollars for this. Mm. Who will answer to me for this crime? Yes. Where is the than, manager? Where is the manager? <laughs> I want to speak to your manager. Yeah. This steak was slightly overcooked, <laughs> and for seventy bucks, my steak better be goddamn perfect. Yeah. Also, you, you, you if you go to Smith and Walensky, um, there's no free refills. <laughs> But fat. <laughs> you're gonna be there like, oh, kid, you want to diet another diet coke? Yes. You get to the end of it, you're like, eight diet cokes, five bucks a piece. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I should have been. I drinking love scotch. New York. New York is great. <laughs> Why doesn't everyone live here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how the people who live here live here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's that's an important thing when it comes to comes to matching value up. You, do we want to talk about some myths? Let's talk about some myths. Yeah. Okay. So um, the first myth that we've already mentioned is um, that the, you deserve to be paid for your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the market just determines what you deserve uh, yeah. based on the value that the people who are interested in your project product determine that to be uh, your, the amount of work you put in has nothing to do with that. Um, now it might take you a long time to do the first the first thing, but you better get better at it because yeah. that's that's just the deal. And here's a here like here's a great, you know, here's a great um, I don't know analogy. Let's say you hire someone to build a fence, and mm -hmm. they build the fence and it falls over. Are you going to want to pay that person? The answer is no. And like, but I spent twenty hours building a fence. Like I wanted a fence at the end of the day, not a fence mm -hmm. that had fallen over. I want yeah. a fence that stands up, 
so I don't have to look at my nudist neighbors all day. Yeah. Okay, that's what I wanted. I don't want to see old naked people. So fits up. That's what yeah. I want. And so um, that the teenagers next door don't come over and swim in my pool. Yeah, or whatever it happens yeah. to be. Um, so yeah, you don't want to pay someone if the job is not done correctly, like with anything else. And so why should you expect to get money for something just because you spent time doing it? Or if it's like, uh, you have two guys build a fence, one guy finishes in 10 hours, one guy finishes in two hours. And it's like, okay, do you pay the guy who finished in 10 hours more money because he spent more time on it? No, the products are the same. You, The guy who did it in two hours is just going to be, if you charge the same, it's $100 for a dissection of fence. Yeah. Then and the guy who works it does it in two hours is just going to end up making more money. And we had a, we had a music theory teacher in, the in high school who, not high school, in college who said said slow theory is no theory uh because if you're doing music theory really slowly uh it's worthless to you so same thing goes with your productivity if you're doing everything really really slowly it you're you're cutting into your own value and the time it takes you to do it at a slow pace has nothing to do with the, the end result of that yeah product. and i think a lot of i think a lot of first time authors first time musicians they fall into that mm -hmm. trap because they're like i worked so hard on this project and then people are not interested in giving me money mm -hmm. for the project. Yeah. And then they, they're like, well, I just, I've worked so hard. I deserve, I deserve this thing is so valuable to me. It's like, well, it, the value to other people is yeah. what matters. So that's the first, that's probably the so, first big myth. So this, the second myth that I'm thinking of really ties into the first myth. And that is if only we weren't so reliant on money, then artistic people would have more time to be artistic and we could create all this great high art all the time. And that's, that's really troublesome to, to think about because what you're saying is that if we took away value signaler and there would just be, there would just be more art everywhere and it would be great and everyone would love it. Uh, but we, we kind of see that what we see already in this, in this indie age of art, is that there's there's more art available now than we could possibly consume ever and a lot of the great works will will never see because there's so much of it um so just because something exists doesn't mean it's good and yeah. just because uh just because things that are good cost money doesn't mean that they are they're worthless because the person who who provided that product has found a group of people who that is valuable to and they're willing to give them money for yeah that. and and part of that thing is like uh, you know there's this uh, i don't know if you look in sort of the academic art world there's a strong distrust of the profit the quote profit motive the profit motive shouldn't people be able to create art without worrying about the profit motive and it's like that's backwards thought Right, we're talking about it. It's yep. it. That's the way that a Marxist views capitalism because they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. The person who's getting money isn't thinking of the profit quote profit motive, because any profit motive he has is completely predicated on his ability to satisfy his customers, to deliver mm -hmm. what other people want, not yeah. what he wants. Yeah. What he wants, he only gets what he wants by delivering on what other people want. So the the profit motive isn't bad at all. It. It's just, it's the inverse of focusing on other people's needs. So if you, once you remove that and you're like, well, we'll just pay artists to be artists. It's like, well, what, what ends up happening there is you're that you're going to get a lot of nihilism. You're going to get a lot of crap, <laughs> you know, is what it is, what ends up happening. It's like, you yeah. might have a couple of good things that come out of like government funded mm -hmm. art, but if they were good, then people would have bought them anyway. Yeah. What you get, what you get with government funded art is you get piss Christ. That's what you get. <laughs> yeah, you get. Yeah, you get. You get good things that didn't need. They, if they if they were good, they didn't need the government funding because mm -hmm. people would have bought them or wanted to see them anyway. Um, or you get things that nobody wants to see, or not enough people want to see to justify the, the existence mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, like, Piss Christ got paid. I don't remember how much. It's thousands of dollars. They yeah. got a grant, thousands of dollars to have this photograph of somebody's religious symbol emerged in, in urine. urine. Right now. What's the problem with that? Well, is it the money? Well, the thing is, is somebody had wanted to pay $5,000 to have a photograph of a crucifix in urine. They're perfectly free to do so. The thing is, mm -hmm. who would have actually done that? Now, someone might have paid $100 for it because they thought that was cool 
and mm-hmm. novel and funny and funny maybe. or something or maybe they would have paid even more maybe that but but like the idea that you took somebody else's money that didn't want that and then gave it to somebody else mm-hmm. regardless like oh it's so great that people make art without the profit motive it's like all the yeah. all the art that really matters to people was probably made with a market in mind meaning to yeah. satisfy somebody else's wants and needs it's like yeah. what's your favorite movie so my favorite movie is this it's like yay capitalism yay capitalism <laughs> you know it's like nobody nobody sits around and be like you know i'm i'm my favorite movie is totally the soviet propaganda movie from the 50s <laughs> maybe somewhere you got me bro maybe i actually there's probably dudes who are like collect propaganda i think jordan peterson collects propaganda his his <laughs> room's full of propaganda because he finds it really interesting yeah you know and so like why is this house full of like communist propaganda he's like i just find it interesting yeah right uh so there's yeah. there's that so yeah the inverse of that is that hey focusing on yeah. other people's needs yeah and and not only that but but as soon as you get the government involved you have to you have to realize that you're you're now taking money from somebody who may not want that art and giving it to someone else to specifically create that art so in the case of piss christ you've stolen money from from people with deep religious beliefs that that this art has offended that they never would have paid for and just and just giving their money to support that and yeah it's like you wouldn't you wouldn't want to take uh government money and give it to somebody whose art was wiping their butt with a quran Mm -hmm. i wouldn't support that (laughs) no one should right yeah it doesn't really and the point is is that you know somebody out there would be completely revolted that their money was being spent on that that's like a double Mm -hmm. whammy um but more than that it's like Somebody might have paid for that, but they probably weren't going to pay. The thing. And the best that you can hope for is that the, that the, the government person managing the, the grants is creating art on other people's behalf. But you're never going to do it yeah. as well as somebody just exchanging money. Yeah. It'd be like, you know what? We're going to buy cool stuff for everybody. So everybody gets a package of cool stuff. And you open yeah. it up and you're like, this is garbage. Somebody somewhere might have thought the person who, who – Said everyone the cool stuff thought it was cool. It's like <laughs> loot crate, but it's just some dude at the top taking a dump inside a box yeah. and then mailing it out to people. <laughs> and, and a glitter bomb goes <laughs> off, but there's glitter oh, everywhere. It's like glitter and shit everywhere. <laughs> just... uh, so yeah, the the profit profit motive bad. That's another myth. Um, if you're getting paid to produce your art, that means you're serving the market. Yeah, on some level, right? And the level at which you're going to serve it, and how you choose to equate that out. I think that the, the secret is to find that balance where you where you're doing what you are really interested in doing, mm-hmm. and you're also finding the people who really want you to do it. And mm-hmm. I think that that's sort of the the hopefully the prosperity yeah. thing. What's another um, myth? Well, before I want to talk about something that I've been I've been thinking about, and I, maybe we can come back to a myth is that uh, providing value doesn't mean that you have to give your artistic product away necessarily. The other thing that can be you giving value before before you're given value in return is by raising capital so if you're working a job so that you can pay for your writing habit which is what i do that that is providing value so i go i go and i teach at a, at a school i teach music and then i raise money and i save money so that i can pay for things like book covers and advertising to to show people that they might like my book so that's another way that i am providing value outside of that and then part of part of advertising yeah. believe it or not is is actually you are you are triggering a tr- trust mechanism because you're showing people that you're willing to spend your own your money own yeah money. you're willing to spend um, money to to capture somebody's to, attention yeah. so that's you a, have to have a certain amount of confidence so that's a big that's a big thing with uh with like book cover design so that's whenever really people point. tell you whenever people tell you don't judge a book by its cover it's like well if you have a crappy cover you're signaling to me that you didn't feel confident or you didn't care enough about your market to say, I better have a good cover for them. I really want to, I really want to give somebody a, a good front face to yeah. my work. And, and not only that, there was a, there was a, there was a book con a couple months ago. And I, I remember some, some bookstore somewhere was like, like now we wrap all of our books in, in paper, paper bags so that you, you can't, and it's just got a little synopsis on the front that we hand right and it's so gorgeous so that you can't judge the book by its cover and it's like listen you realize that people get paid to design book covers so there's another artist who you're you're stealing their 
like their people's enjoyment of them. Yeah. yeah their value yeah, and, they're contributing to and that the, product. And the, the cover can signal lots of things, right? Yeah. Like I, I recently redesigned the Prophet of the God seed cover. Actually, I have the original over here. Um, the new one has way more, way more cueing into hard sci-fi and like traditional space opera. It's like yeah. it's got a spaceship and a planet. Yeah. And like, what does that signal to someone? It signals to someone like future stuff, space travel, all the stuff that's in the book. I'm telling you what's in the book mm -hmm. so that your expectations are primed for what you're going to read. Yeah. Um, that's what it, that's what a cover does. If you pick up a book cover and it's got an elf with like a spear, you're like, oh, I'm going to read a fantasy tale about elves. And then you yeah. open it up and it's a cookbook. It's bizarro cookbook. Yeah, you wouldn't. You'd all of a sudden you'd be like, I, uh, uh, uh why, why did uh, I buy this? Like, it's the whole point is just to like let people know what what they can expect and what's inside of it. Yeah. Um, the cover is important, and I think it's important as a consumer. You want, um, you know, when there's a million choices out there, you want the one that signals best to you the expectation that you're looking for, like the thing that you're looking for. So um, that is important. Like the raising capital thing is a good point because you're serving other people's needs. You don't have to, you don't have to go into any artistic endeavor with the intent to make a bunch of money. Yeah. I'm going to put out an album this year. I don't expect to make a bunch of money on it. Uh, the only big investment really is my time. Uh, I guess there's my instruments, but I've used those for 20 yeah. years to make money. So whatever. So I've invested my time on it. And if someone wants to buy it and they have value, that's great. And if not, well, then they don't then have there's to. No skin off, there's no there's skin off. There's no skin off anyone's it. back. That's yeah. great. Um, and I don't feel like I, – I feel like that's an artistic thing I wanted to – I wanted to make the music so that it existed. Mm -hmm. And if nobody buys it, I don't really care that much. Um, that's okay. That's okay with me. And that's okay to do that too. So I guess there's the other flip side. You don't yeah. have to – if you're not making money doing this but you enjoy what you're putting out and you enjoy what you're creating for people, then, then, then what's the don't problem? Don't worry about it. There's no yeah. problem, you know. The, the problem is when is when there's a disconnect between those things. Yeah. It's like you can create unmarketable music as long as it's the art that you really want to exist. Yeah. Don't feel the least bit bad about that. But don't create unmarketable music that is the thing that you really want to just exist and then get and then upset it, yeah. that people aren't just giving and you then, money for it. Yeah, and then be pissed off that you're not Metallica. Like, that's unrealistic. Yeah, that's that's um, yeah, you got to got to rectify those two expectations, make expectations match reality. Yeah. Any other myths? I think I'm thinking of one more. You got one more? The myth of the starving artist. Okay. So the myth of the starving artist is that like um a true artist makes art only for himself and nobody else. And therefore because the market doesn't care about him because he's not creating, you know, vapid pop music or something. He's starving. Mm -hmm. And the truth is you don't need to be a starving artist and no one should be a starving artist. If you're not producing work that anyone likes, then you have to be okay doing something else to get your meal. You just yeah. have to be okay with that. You're not going to starve. You got to be doing something else. Yeah. You can't be upset about it, right? That's your choice. You're making mm -hmm. an elective choice. If you're making great music that everyone likes and people aren't buying it, then there's some disconnect in there. They're, you're not... You're not offering enough value up front so people – you're not like putting your music out uh, yeah. out there on like Spotify or something so people can hear it and be like, what is that? I want to get more of it. Yeah. Um, you're not developing that trust. Yeah, you're not developing the trust to sell it. You're not advertising right. You don't have the right distribution going. There's something wrong in the in the, in the the how you're putting it out there. Um, or, you're make, you know, or you're making music that, that people don't like. And if you're making – if you're making music that people really want to like and your marketing mechanism is working – then you you can make You're a living make doing some money, it, yeah. you know, and um, you can do it with books or music or, you know, or I think in the future we'll see more movies that are able to do it. I hope the, so. As the cost of really producing so. videos goes down and down, we'll I think we'll see I think we'll get to see a lot more movies happening and people being able to perhaps create their living generating a lot of uh, movie content, um, yeah. which I I'm certainly would be excited to see in the future. So that's Definitely. the last little myth. You're not you're not like more artistic because people aren't buying your art. Yeah, and and I think especially like Kiss was very famous for this of like selling out of the first chance they get, and selling out to Kiss meant that they just came out with a bunch of merchandise and, and sold it and sold it. What the hell is wrong with that? Why or people it? like Trey Parker, you're selling out by doing a voice in Despicable Me Three. He's like, have you seen how much money I make in one night of, of Book, Book of Mormon? Mormon? <laughs> I've been yeah. selling out every night <laughs> yeah. for years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I don't know. That's the, that's the thing you have to keep in mind. It's not it's not bad to make money. And you can make great art and make money. 
Yeah. Uh, I don't know too many people who, you know, read something that's a really like hyper best selling book and and actually think it's garbage. Yeah. Um, it's good for someone on some level, and in a lot of cases, it's really good art too. Yeah, you know, you yeah. probably wouldn't say Lord of the Rings is bad art. Yeah, say it's great art. Personally, even, I love even it. if you don't like it, yeah, be, you, and, you and, would say that it was. You know, Harry Potter's like really, really mass market, but it's really well done. It's a well, it's a good piece of craft, yeah. and it's it's a very well constructed product. And even even let's say if we if we go to if we go to the music side and and you say like Justin Bieber. You know, I, don't, I certainly don't like Justin Bieber's music at all. But if the, there is a bigger portion of the market that does, that's a, okay. as opposed to me. And, and that's and the I'm thing totally is I don't, I don't have to sit around and listen to Justin Bieber. That's what's glorious. That's what's great about it. Yeah. They can listen to it and I can listen and, to Winter Sun. And Twilight Force. And Dragon Force. And Lost Horizon. Lost Horizon. <laughs> all right. This has been Riders of the Dawn. Um, oh wait, yeah, we've got to plug the books. Mortal Fear, it's out. Check it out. You can find it on Amazon, um, or check me out. You can go to matthewjwellman.com and hop on his list, matthewjwellman.com/list. Right? Yep, that's right. Okay, I got two. I'm gonna plug right here. Um, this is my new one, Water of Awakening. I'm very, very proud of this novel. This is a high fantasy novel, adventure fantasy. Oh, I um, mean. Just like Twilight Force, actually, same artist who did the Twilight Force cover did the cover, did my cover image here, mm -hmm. and it, I really like him. His name is Karen Bayat. He's a Turkish guy, awesome artist, um, and uh, this is available on Amazon. You can get the ebook for ninety nine cents, or you can get this lovely paperback, which I designed myself for nine ninety nine. And then, of course, Prophet of the God Seed, which we actually designed the IP for together. So we designed the IP Deep Time, and this also includes in it a story by. Mr. Wellman here called um, Burdens of the Patriarch, one of the very yep. first stories we we wrote or he wrote um, while we were designing um, the universe of Deep Time yep. and designing all the characters. So here it is. This is the old cover. Um, you can still get this paperback right now, but there's will be a new cover coming out shortly that pegs the genre a little bit more. That's what it is, Prophet of the God Seed. It's actually free on Amazon as an ebook right now, or you can get the paperback for six ninety nine, <clears throat> which is nice and cheap. Yeah. Um, uh, Immortal Fear, ninety nine cents for the ebook, nine ninety nine for the paperback. Uh, a ex an excellent urban fantasy, excellent in my opinion, obviously, and uh, very heavily influenced by North Norse mythology. You're going to see a lot yeah. of the, this gods likewise crawling crawling around. This is my own mythology but it's very very influenced by North, norse mythology as well and it's very influenced by it's it's sort of like a wild high fantasy reimagining of some fairy tale ideas too yeah so, all right i think that's going to call it. it all right thank you so much for watching uh, you can find me at uh, dvspress.com davidbstuart.com you can join my mailing list at um dvspress.com slash list and i will give a free book to you and you'll find out which one, probably one that you'll like, one that I'm very, very mm -hmm. proud of. MatthewJWellman.com slash list. Same deal. I'll give you a free book. All right. Have a good one.